Welcome to the lecture on practice feedback and learning by doing. I am Ken Gatinger. Here we go with the lecture slides. This lecture corresponds with chapter 13 in the Clark and Mayer textbook. There are some other readings I would recommend here that you can link to from these slides, including a couple of chapters from a book, Make It Stick, a paper we wrote uh, on how learning is not a spectator sport on the importance of learning by doing and then link to 10 benefits of the testing effect as an idea that's related to practice that's described in that make it stick and given in this example. The objectives for this unit include the following. We're gonna start first uh, with the uh, goal of helping you learn to explain how deliberate practice is different from the general idea of practice. It builds on the general idea of practice. And we'll start by talking about what is practice and then move to differentiating the key features of deliberate practice. Practice involves interactions that promote psychological engagement, thinking with the content in ways that helps learn, help learners build knowledge and skills that are related to the learning goals that you designed the practice for. Practice uh, can be connected to this matrix uh, that is in the Clark and Mayer textbook that varies behavioral activity, which is something you can observe directly, and psychological activity. One thing for sure that practice does that differentiates it from passive learning situations like reading a textbook or watching a lecture is we get to observe behavior in the response as students answer practice questions. Uh, so certainly it's high in behavior and we hope as a consequence good practice activities should be high in psychological activity that's relevant to the learning goal and therein is often the design challenge that you will face is just because it's high in behavioral activity doesn't always mean you get what you want. You might actually have low psychological activity with respect to the learning goals and the thinking you're after. So behavioral activity is achieved in practice because practice exercises require students' responses. So they are necessarily high in behavioral activity. Uh, psychological activity is encouraged because practice activities should engage in cognitive processing that is essential to the desired expert performance, uh, um, accurate or good performance that you want students to uh, achieve. When you're uh, having students practice principles, which are a kind of knowledge component that have a rationale, it's good to en enhance those activities to connect to the underlying meanings to those rationales. So you want to design to engage in generative sense-making processes with skills and other kind of KC that is often more implicit and, and may, be, may not have a deep rationale or an articulated rationale. You still want to be engaging students in psychological activity. We uh, can format practice different ways and here are some examples of how that can be done in an e-learning setting. Uh, there's multiple choice or sometimes called menu-based. There's simulation, uh, multiple select and drag and drop. And there's also simple text fields and text areas. Uh, so short answer and even longer answers. What is important is that the practice questions and activities engage learners psychologically in ways that are congruent with the longer term target application environment. And we'll talk about matching the, the job skill, the future job, future school topic, future life. In psychology, this idea is referred to as transfer appropriate processing. And it's key there that it's not simply about matching the behavior of the job or, or the future uh, life skill but it's that the thinking needed to be accurate in those job, school, or life situations in the future, that that thinking is being exercised in a way that's appropriate to transfer to the future, those future target situations. 
the format certainly is less important than the psychological uh, processes uh, that you want to promote. A multiple choice question can be uh, a kind of simple recall question, but it can also be an application question that gets at deeper skills. So uh, many times multiple choice is thought of as uh, not very good because many multiple choice questions are simply about recalling, say, vocabulary. But uh, well-designed multiple choice can really get at deeper psychological processes. Here's an example where the open-ended response would be to type the formula in these cells. But this is a way to give students feedback by having them pick what, which of these they would type. And as a matter of fact, the key idea here is in where these dollar signs appear in, in this formula. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, as the feedback message shows down here, this is the wrong response. So uh, the key here is helping students get feedback on their errors and the particulars of entering it may not be all that important. Um, certainly easier to implement multiple choice as well. Um, simulations are relevant as they require the learner to respond according to the instructional objective. Here, uh, this is in essence a simple version of a simulation where they're actually doing the, the work in the spreadsheet. Um, certainly there are many more complicated simulations. You can have simulations of doing an operation, for example, that provide for safety. They can also sim you can also simulate things that don't happen in the real world very often. So you can get a repetition in practice, for instance. Um, here's a simulation example uh, uh, of electrical circuits and learning how to use this meter to try to debug, to find this the cause of, a, of an error in a circuit. Uh, and in the simulation, you can get actual values by uh, um, putting these meter pointer ends at the various points here. Another version is multiple select questions that require the learner to identify several correct items. Um, these can be more difficult to give sp specific items feedback on, and they also produce some grading challenges. Uh, many existing platforms have pretty complicated schemes for grading these. And I wish they were simpler because essentially what we have is a series of four true false questions that are embedded in the same context. And a, and a student who, uh, let's say the right answer is um, A and C. If a student just, uh, if student selects A, B, and C, they've only got one of the four ones wrong. They, they said B was true when it was actually false. So they probably should get 75% credit on this one, having gotten three or four right. But most systems will not give that credit. If you don't get them all right, you don't get uh, any credit. So an alternative is to write them separately as multiple choice, um, to build your system sort, sorry, as true and false. You can also make them multiple choice, but if you have multiple correct answers, just pick one and pick you know at least two of the incorrect answers and make multiple choice and rather than multiple select. Uh, drag and drops, another version, um, you can do drag and drop to uh, produce sequences and procedures. If you've ever used Duolingo, they have drag and drop of words to create sentences in a foreign language you're learning. Those are sometimes called jumbles. In computer science, there's a special name for this in, in learning to program. You can give students lines of code that they need to order, uh, select from and order. Uh, they're called Parsons problems, but it's basically the same idea. In cognitive tutors, we tend to build these interfaces that are multi-step. Um, they, they facilitate complex combinations of these different elements. And, and this is made possible in the cognitive tutor authoring tools. In this uh, tutor in genetics, you can see here pop-up menus and text fields being intermixed with sentences or in a table here um, where the student is explaining when this condition occurs, then this outcome occurs, and there are some text fields here to enter some quantities about the enzymatic activity. And as you can see, this is a, a pretty complicated task like student, you know, maybe not unlike 
students working on paper, but with more scaffolding and the opportunity for feedback. There are other virtual classroom environments, learning management systems, uh, things like Canvas and Blackboard, for example. And there's many more of these that are certainly coming on board uh, where students can uh, engage in uh, chat, polling, uh, going to breakout rooms, uh, have discussions. All of these provide modes, modes of practice. In some of the things we've talked about, it's much easier to give feedback, like on multiple choice questions, multiple select, uh, the drag and drop, the uh, pop-up menus, even those small text fields, if the, if the input is, say, a number. Um, there can be some nuances on the difference between 0 0.2 and 0.2, um, but uh, those can be all be reasonably e easily graded and, and students can be given feedback. It gets harder as there is more open-ended responses involved uh, to give immediate feedback. And, and so there's a design question there, uh, design dilemma, if you will, between the advantages and disadvantages of giving such feedback. So that's practice. How about deliberate practice? Well, deliberate practice features here include four. Um, first of all, a student must have motivation to engage in effortful in exertion to in improve performance. It's key to deliberate practice. It's hard. There's a notion here that the brain doesn't uh, learn without some effort, no pain, no gain. Uh, so students need some motivation to engage in deliberate practice. There need to be carefully tailored tasks that focus on the edge of students' competence, on their, on their areas of weakness. And one way to design such tasks is to do cognitive task analysis, and, and that's a topic addressed in other units. The third thing here is that deliberate practice involves feedback on students' responses. There's instruction on errors, and that's very crucial because um, for one, uh, learning is, is about reducing errors, but for another, students who aren't practicing can sometimes have an uh, illusion of knowing. It feels like they understand, but when they are uh, finally put in a situation where they need to bring the knowledge to bear, they may, uh, multiple things may happen. They may find that they didn't have the full idea. They may find that they had an uh, an approximate version of the idea that doesn't work in some context, they may have trouble retrieving it. And that uh, gets to the last point, which is about continued repetition uh, so that there's multiple chances to fix errors, to strengthen man memory, and not mentioned in this slide is to see the concept or skill in multiple contexts to build a general and accurate piece of knowledge that can work in lots of new situations it's needed to work in in the future. Deliberate practice is a super powerful form of the general idea of learning by doing. There are other alternative ways to implement learning by doing, but deliberate practice is one that uh, incorporates uh, the features we've just mentioned. And my nutshell summary of, of it is that good learning by doing instruction requires repeated practice on well-tailored tasks in varied contexts with explanatory feedback and as needed in instruction. And we'll be elaborating on that, uh, on these features and others in the rest of the lecture. Cognitive tutors are a great example of, of these features because they provide re repeated practice. There's cognitive task analysis to create well-tailored tasks. Those tasks involve varied contexts um, they come with feedback and explanations. And when students get stuck, they get ad as needed feedback. So that's it for this first learning objective and I uh, hope you're in a position to explain uh, what practice is and how deliberate practice is different from the general idea of practice.